we're going to talk about not red blood cell transfusions, but we'll talk about everything else. And just as things are very confusing for red blood cell transfusions, in other words, different centers do different things, uh, you're going to find the same for FFP platelets and cryoprecipitate, um, certainly across the United States, uh, and really it's around the world. Uh, everybody has sort of the same problem. It's not unique here um, in that nobody really, I think, nobody really knows exactly what they're doing. So when nobody really knows what they're doing, there's lots of experts, <clears throat> and the expert is the guy with the most gray hair and the most outspoken, um, and perhaps the guy with the, with the highest title in your particular operating room. So we'll talk about um, triggers, endpoints, um, and some other things to do with heart surgery for that. Uh, <clears throat> disclosures. Um, most of these things don't have too much to do with this. I do work a fair amount with some of the TEG companies, um, Hemos, Hemonetics, uh, and now a new one called Hemasonics, which actually makes a new, uh, not yet available machine where they use ultrasound to bombard the, <clears throat> the clot as the clot's being formed and can give you a TEG-like tracing within a really about 10 minutes, um, but that's not available for utilization yet. So we'll talk about some of the history and the present practice. Um, I'll show you just how crazy the practice is. Um, give you a few bits about trolley. I think trolley is the number one reason why we should spend lots of time worrying about transfusion. Now, our last wonderful speaker, <clears throat> you know, talked about TAVARS. Um, and I am convinced that once we do enough of these patients with TAVARS, um, the length of stay in ICUs will go to almost zero, or they should go, all be able to go to step downs. Nobody should be on ventilators. Um, unless some disaster happens. But the long-term ventilator patients should go away. And <clears throat> we still have uh, lots of problems on cardiopulmonary bypass patients with patients on ventilators. A significant number of them are on ventilators for a period of time afterwards. And I'm convinced a fair amount of that is trolley, or at least it's related to trolley. And so um, these new surgical and cardiology techniques will take care of one of our problems for us that we've been unwilling to take care of on our own, really, which is to just tackle the question of transfusion. We'll talk about when you should use FFP, um, platelets, cryoprecipitate, talk about what's actually in them, um, and then some of the algorithms, do they make sense or not, and some new options that are out there that are really the Europeans are bringing to us. <clears throat> and I think in Europe, you will find that um, today, there's almost no use of cryoprecipitate anymore. They use fibrinogen concentrate, and they are rapidly reducing the utilization of FFP by using the PCCs. So the question is, you know, what's the limit on those? Just as we've seen that, you know, the future's going towards more and more utilization of these cool techniques, um, why can't we embrace them? Um, <clears throat> transfusion behavior is very bizarre. I've said that all around the world. Um, and I'm going to go to the bottom, which is that it's driven by fear. So whether you give red cells, you don't really know why you're giving red cells. You're giving red cells because you don't want something bad to happen, right? But you have no real way of measuring what that something bad could be or the risk for that particular patient. Same thing with um, transfusion for uh, or infusion of coagulation products. What's the one thing surgeons are most scared about? Bleeding. Bleeding's bad, but what are we not really studied and not really know about is thrombosis, which is the other side of the yin and the yang of the equation. <clears throat> and here's the problem. Coagulation is so complex, none of us in this room can, st can understand it. And what you were taught, at least what we were taught in med school, or you guys were taught in perfusion, you know, with, this, with the intrinsic and extrinsic cascades, has nothing to do with reality has absolutely nothing to do with reality. That is based upon how people in the 1950s and 1960s ferreted out various fairly rare congenital protein coagulation dysfunctions. 
Today, we know that there are 800 reactions that are all occurring simultaneously, feeding forwards and feeding backwards, and they are simultaneous within milliseconds of each other in a microenvironment where things are going on. So if you have 800 reactions all happening in near real time, how can you wrap your head around it when you just see somebody bleeding? You, you don't. And <clears throat> there are now computer models. There's one computer model that uses 150 reactions um, all going on at once. And so if you make a change in one thing or another, um, what is the one thing that you or I are going to do that's going to make this all better? It, it just, you just can't possibly get at it without computer models, and we're not there yet. So um, it's no wonder that people throw their hands up in the air and throw the kitchen sink of everything they've got possible in there with a hope that something good happens. And most of the time, Mother Nature just takes care of it for us. And most of the time, <clears throat> or very often, it's tincture of time that somehow um, the homeostatic processes have to come back around to being able to get us um, blood that actually coagulates. So here's um, study 2008. A group of us from Expi in 1999, 2000, published the first study looking at <clears throat> behavior of transfusion. And the long story short was that transfusion behavior hasn't changed. I suspect it may be changing today, but not dramatically. I, I think when we look at STS database and such, the, the total number of red cells utilized are going down. And in some places, the total numbers of FFP and platelets are going down. But, there, but you can still see this huge, massive variation. So intraoperative utilization, Jeff, you were saying that yours is like 4% or something, intraoperative utilization of red cells. Well, <clears throat> so back in 2008, the best was 9% interoperative utilization. We're at another center, and these are 68 centers around the world. Another center was 100% get red cells. Who's right? Well, look down, look at all the variability. Post-op, um, <clears throat> it's variability, variability across, the, uh, across everything. Here's variability within a system. This is the um, Providence Healthcare System, Intermountain West, uh, from Washington State, Idaho, down all the way down to California. I think there's 11 different heart centers there that are doing heart surgery. This is utilization of red cells at those various different heart centers. And <clears throat> so A is one hospital that happens to be Everett, Washington. Um, the uh, L happens to be in Los Angeles. And the individual bars within each center are the behavior of each surgeon within the groups in the centers. So you'll see there's a culture of transfusion at one center, and then there's an individual variability within the behavior patterns of the physicians who are there. So transfusion is a behavior. It's not a scientifically indicated uh, requirement. And so it's a behavior, and <clears throat> in, I think it was 2010, they stopped heart surgery for four days. I flew out to Los Angeles. We talked about, they brought all their heart surgery groups together, and, they, and the CEO of the entire system said, somebody here is doing something right, and somebody here is doing something wrong, and you guys are costing me a lot of money because um, you guys in Los Angeles, you know, you show me that your patients got better outcomes than the ones in Everett, and indeed the ones in Everett have the best outcomes. But... I'd like to say that's because they transfuse the, less, the least. It might be that they have the best communication as a team, that the team's working the best and the team's most harmonically in tune, but we don't really know. But it's fascinating just to look at behavior. And that's what it is. It's human behavior of a culture, and it's a culture driven by fear. And that is totally wrong as medicine. So <clears throat> here's from Australia. I, for some reason, Australia and New Zealand have totally gotten into blood management. The Australian government flew me over there a couple of years ago to meet and decide how can we construct a blood management program for the entire country. And here's what they found, that they have the same problem early on, before they got really involved with their blood management, that you know the variability is the same as it is in the U.S. around the world. It's all over the place. 
Well, the SCA STS guidelines came out originally in 2007, revised in 2011. And what do they say about, um, <clears throat> you know, what do they say about use of FFP platelets and cryo? Well, they say a number of different things, but the number one thing they say is be a team. Talk about it, get organized, and get some rationality to it, and they talk about algorithms. How many of you religiously use an algorithm in your operating rooms when you have an average patient, a bleeding patient, or a potentially thrombosing patient? Hands? You know, it's like hearing crickets. I hear, I see one or two hands. You know, <clears throat> here's the STS SCA guidelines, and it's tough. It's tough to get a bunch, you know, it's tough to herd cats and get them all in the same room, let alone all agree on when we're going to use the, the, the available monitoring systems that are out there. And <clears throat> then when you have a bleeding patient and you're, and you're faced with one, to have the faith in the algorithms to say, ah, we'll stick with the algorithm. We're not, we're not going to depart from it because we know it will work for us. It's tough. So VCU tried it. I've done it in every institution I've gone to, and um, we've had partial success. We had great success at VCU when I had some, some really wonderful surgeons that I was working with for a number of years who really bought into and liked the idea of, um, of the team. Then they left, we got new surgeons, and you know it was me pushing the rock uphill again. And so we've tried this, um, May 13th was of last year, we were supposed to have a retreat for all the surgeons and anesthesiologists, perfusionists, everybody was gonna be involved. Never happened. One thing came up, another thing came up, nothing ever happened. But we were going to try to roll out a TEG-based set of algorithms. Um, <clears throat> it is a bit tough to make progress, as we've all seen. Um, I guess we're now going through that catharsis once again, um, politically, and I won't go there. But maybe I'll be moving to New Zealand or Australia if something <laughs> happens here. <clears throat> but at any rate, it's tough to get people who have such um, diametrically opposed views on the world to all get in the same room and actually come together and decide on an algorithm. This is the algorithm we decided on. Um, we now have it posted back in the institution I just left two weeks ago. Um, and it is, I would say, utilized in about 45 or 50 percent of cases. It's, it was used in 100 percent of cases where I showed up because the residents were all worried that you know I'd be on their case if they didn't do it, but it, it was a pre-bypass um, set of set of labs, um, immediate pre-weaning set of labs, and uh, five minutes post-protamine set of laboratory values all drawn, and then an algorithm, a treatment algorithm based on it. You're not going to all memorize that, but um, I can certainly hand it out to anybody that wants it. TEG. What's the beauty of the TEG? The beauty of the TEG is that it looks at whole blood coagulation. Remember I said there's 800 different reactions all happening? Uh, the surface of the platelet we now know has probably, I don't know, last count I got was about 45 or 50 different protein sensors on the surface of the platelet. And <clears throat> so those various different sensing glycoproteins that um, binding sites can upregulate, downregulate platelets. Well, here's a little factoid. So do red cells. Red cells have GP2B3A binding sites on their surfaces. That's where fibrinogen binds. Did anybody know that? Well, not many people do. But so also do white cells. So all these various different cells have the similar types of glycoprotein binding sites. And why would we ever care about coagulation clinically when we take those away. And that's what PTPTT does. It just takes them all away, throws them away, and says, we don't care about any of those. We just want to know what, how, how the proteins react and how the proteins react when we go and we put some homogenized rabbit brain in there and some dirt. Because, you know, that's how we're going to see whether it works or not. And so, <clears throat> you know, this, is, this at least looks at a whole system together 
And it's still pretty Neolithic, if you think about it, which is just what's the clot strength over time based on various different activators we can put in, and it's, and it's a mechanically based kind of thing. It's 1940s technology. Here's the latest, newest one. It comes out of Germany, the Rotem. And so whether you have a cup with a piston that rotates or a piston that rotates in a stable cup, that's the difference between these two technologies. And so, you know, they're apples and they're totally apples and oranges. TEG is completely in my blood. I started working on it in the early 1980s when I um, was forced to train to learn how to do liver transplants at the University of Pittsburgh. And I said to the group that was doing liver transplants back there, has anybody used this for heart surgery? And the response was, why would you do that? I said, well, you know, liver transplant patients bleed, but we do have a little problem with bleeding and heart surgery. This works for you. We should work for it for us. Um, so I, you know, it's been, it, I've been involved with it. But to my great joy, it's not just been me. There are now thousands of publications in the literature about TEG for clinical medicine. There's totally now about 4,500 publications, um, and it's <clears throat> being utilized as a, as a pretty aggressive uh, basic science research tool, not just a clinical tool. But when you go to some of these that have to do with cardiac, and I'm sorry the blue doesn't show up as well as maybe some other colors could have here, but the conclusions are all pointing in one direction, that when you use either the Rotem or the TEG, the conclusions are that you improve outcome for your patients, and you reduce, and you reduce blood utilization, and you reduce um, even some of the <coughs> uh, potential bad outcomes at length of stay and stuff, and I'll show you that data in a minute. And it's very few monitoring technologies anywhere that have come around in clinical medicine that we can show that by increasing the monitoring, we've changed clinical outcome. Take EKG, for instance. Nobody has ever showed that by running EKGs, you improve outcome for patients. Wow. Same thing with blood gases. Those kinds of overall big things have never been done, but it just makes sense to all of us, right? So <clears throat> it is said, could be sad, that 90% of bleeding is surgical. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's only 40, 50, 60%. But if you have a hole in a blood vessel, it will certainly bleed more once we start to get the coagulopathy. And I don't care whether you say, you know, the the hole's too big or it's not, it, <clears throat> they, they feed together. And obviously, the more that you bleed, if you have a surgical bleed, the longer you bleed, the more you lose, the more precursors are gone. So, they, so you can't really separate them and say, well, you know, it's, not, it's, it's more of a medical bleed than it is a surgical bleed. They interact together. Um, <clears throat> STS guidelines have only been adopted by certainly less than 20%. We saw a show of hands here. I think I saw three go up. So um, maybe four if you include my, my hands. But so the intraoperative utilization, I think, can make a big difference. Um, one, of, one of the caveats is getting the temperature right. Uh, don't run TEGs on everybody who's cold. And we also have a problem with definitions. Um, if you go to publish a paper about transfusion and heart surgery, it very, may very well come across my desk as, you know, as an editor to, uh, to review it, and I say that probably one or two units of red blood cells may or may not have been necessary for the patient to begin with, but at five, at five units of red blood cells, we start to call it a massive transfusion in heart surgery. Well, massive transfusion in trauma and the rest of the massive transfusion world is one blood volume. If we waited for a blood volume out in heart surgery, we'd have a whole lot <clears throat> different definition. Um, so um, definitions are one problem that we have. The Rotem uh, has the beauty and maybe a problem in that you can get essentially a cheap PT and a cheap PTT off of it by an, an XTEM and an INTEM. And so one of the selling points for this 
piece of technology was that if they activate the blood with the same activators that you would use for a uh, PT and an APTT, you can get similar kinds of data out of it. And Jerry Levy and Ken Tanaka, two other big names in this you know, research world, have done that. Um, <clears throat> once again, you can see that the TEG and the ROTEM have similar kinds of um, uh, measurements that are made off the TEG trace. And um, again, they just call them different things, but they're essentially the same kinds of pieces of data. But here's what I wanted to get at to you. And one of my problems with really embracing this technology is who cares? The PT and the PTT are less than 50% predictive of who will bleed after heart surgery. There's nine different studies that have showed that. So if you have a test or a set of tests, standard coagulation tests, wherein you can flip a coin and you can do better, why should we create a new technology to try to meet the gold standard, which was less than 50% accurate? That to me is like, really? Uh, you know, who, who's run, you know, are the lunatics running the asylum? Why, why are we doing this? So, <clears throat> um, and they, you know, these guys published a lot of papers saying, well, you can actually do that. The take home point from what we need to do is when you apply these technologies, do patients do better? And this is a study we did way back in the early to mid 1990s, wherein we changed practice at the University of Washington. And the most major thing we did was if a patient was bleeding in the ICU, we made them get a TEG before we came back to the operating room. Now, obviously, if somebody's tamponaded or they just put out a thousand cc's out of their chest tube, we're rushing back to the operating room. But if there's a slow dribble ooze stuff, let's take a look at it and see if it's normal or abnormal. And if you have a normal TEG, with greater than 93% accuracy, we could predict whether or not you had a surgical bleed. Now, there's been 13 studies to follow that, and they range from 91% to 97% predictive accuracy of whether you have a bleed or not. So if we did nothing else with this technology, but decided when we should leave the ICU to come back in the middle of the night versus staying there and treating something medically, that alone is a useful um, decision tree for the ICU. So uh, <clears throat> Par Johansson, who's a blood banker in um, Copenhagen, Denmark, has really embraced this TEG and um, now has published extensively, mostly in trauma. He works with some people in Sweden and such on um, on TEG and, um, and heart surgery. But he's found 97 predictability, that's viscoelastic hematology assessment and identifying a surgical cause of bleeding and postoperative surgery. So 97% accuracy, wow. What, what lab test is 97% accurate in terms of teaching you a clinical decision making? There's none that I know of. So you can look at, <clears throat> at, at how effective these, these are for the glycoproteins. I point out that really what you're looking at with a TEG is the 2B3A binding site where fibrinogen binds, and that's really, Glanzmann's thrombus, thrombosthenia has to do with a congenital problem at that binding site, and so you can actually pick it up with a TEG. There are modified ones now that look at um, ADP, and thrombin activation, and you can do what's called platelet mapping. I'm not gonna go into that in a great way, but to say that you can actually map out where some of these uh, defects are. And <clears throat> lo and behold, a group from out in, in Colorado has done that, and people have said, well, this is really important for us um, in patients who have Plavix um, and in patients who are on aspirin, and that's important. But also, if you do this platelet mapping, you can figure out who has had the inflammatory effects on the glycoprotein binding sites to the greatest amount. In other words, 
We know, and we all blame the perfusionists. Sorry, guys, you guys have taken the blame for years and years. It's their machine, you know, it's their machine. It's probably not your machine. It's probably a combination of a whole lot of other things, not the least of which is probably heparin. Heparin is one of the nastiest drugs in the world for setting up inflammation. And heparin changes a lot of these glycoprotein binding sites, and, w and everybody has a different biologic reaction to it. But Look at that, 78% sensitivity, 84% specificity for who has excessive bleeding if you map the platelet function after heart surgery. Once again, highly, highly accurate, and we shouldn't be depending just upon, you know, seat of the pants technology, which is give them, give them some platelets, they were on Plavix. Okay, you know, we can do better than that. Um, <clears throat> so, platelet mapping, this is by White soul, he's, oh, this is the group from out in, in yeah, 83% sensitivity, specificity for high bleeding. This is the group from out in Colorado. So you can also use heparinase into the TEG, and this is what we do. Um, we um, use this before coming off bypass, so I try to look across the drapes to my surgeon and say, you know, I think we're going to be okay. Um, and any number of times, We've looked at each other as we went into the case and said, uh oh, this one's going to bleed, this one's going to bleed, and we come off bypass. And just as we're getting ready to come off bypass, I've got the TEG and it's dead on normal. And I said, you know, let's at least give this a try. We can, we can order from the blood bank, just don't release, keep the stuff up there, just let it be, and we can get it in five minutes if we need to, but let's use the, let's use the technology. And it is by far and away the most sensitive test for trace amounts of heparin. Your ACT will not pick up trace amounts of heparin. And the whole argument about whether somebody reheparinizes and, and such, utilizing this test will find it um, so dramatically. And it's a great test actually for overall inflammation. Those patients who are most inflamed will have the biggest changes um, in these whole blood viscoelastic tests, and it's also the greatest test for hypercoagulability. Now, somebody needs to really get into this, and it's probably going to have to be a cardiologist or an internist or a hospice or a hospitalist who wishes to look at patients who are being discharged from cardiac surgery out 7, 10, 14, 21 days afterwards um, because the surge of hypercoagulability is at about 5 to 14 days after heart surgery. And it's not uncommon for us to send somebody home and then them to have a stroke or them to have a, you know, have, have graphs go down um, because the, the body's natural defense is to, is to create hypercoagulability. So the more we can study it, and look at strokes and mortality and stuff by studying the hypercoagulable patients versus the normals makes all the difference. Trauma, it's taking off in trauma, big, big time. Trauma, um, the, out of the Iraq-Afghanistan wars, um, uh, Colonel um, Holcomb, yep, thanks. Colonel Holcomb, thanks. Colonel Holcomb <coughs> in Iraq. Um, brought TEGs into the war zone, put them in the, in the first, um, first stationed hospitals, and now in trauma surgery, it's uh, going like crazy. And, and it works, and it uh, has, and this is from Gene Cochran's group at University of Colorado, uh, makes a big, big difference. And if, you, and if you've really made it in the world, you get a Cochran review about you, and the Cochran review has actually shown that, <coughs> um, that that it does decrease blood products um, by using these technologies. I'm sort of racing through this because I wanted to get into the other parts, the FFPs and stuff. This is the one study that is fascinating and frankly I hope five or six people repeat it because it's almost unbelievable. 152 patients um, for heart surgery, high-risk heart surgery patients managed by, by Rotem and they showed actually a decrease in mortality. They showed a decrease in FFP, mechanical ventilation time, <clears throat> and uh, overall six-month decrease in mortality. Um, but here's the thing. None of you will ever remember this algorithm because it goes on for pages and pages 
and pages. So that's a research algorithm, right? Because you'll never remember it. I will never remember it. Um, <clears throat> but as I said, the point is, if you look down there in that Kaplan-Meier um, curve, in that 152 patients, they could show a, a reduction in mortality by using a technology to reduce blood transfusion. That, to me, is really key and really important. So what's trolley? So here's something that, again, is cultural, bizarre, and really wrong with medicine. Trolley is defined as, you know, trans transfusion-related acute lung injury. If I walked around my operating rooms in my old hospital and asked 30 surgical residents to define trolley for me, I probably wouldn't get many good answers. Um, I certainly have never heard anybody, anesthesia or surgery, giving informed consent to patients for blood transfusion and informing them about trolley. Because if you did, and you said, um, you know, don't worry about HIV, don't worry about hepatitis, <clears throat> if you get a blood transfusion, your lungs may fill up with fluid, and um, you'll have to be on a, on a ventilator for a couple of days. And if you're having heart surgery, your mortality with that is 50%. Blood's really safe, can you sign? That's a whole lot different than what is being told today. The US government gets it. If you go to AHRQ website, they are trying to educate physicians about trolley like crazy. There are at least 10 case examples there about patients getting trolley and trying to um, get us to understand them. A few years ago, probably about 10 years ago, I was given a lecture to a group of cardiac surgeons, and I said, have any of you ever seen trolley? And they say, no, I've never seen trolley. It doesn't exist. It's not a problem in heart surgery. I said, have you ever had somebody stay on a ventilator in your ICU longer than you thought? Yeah. Do you transfuse yet? Yeah, we transfuse 60% of patients. How do you know it's not trolley? It can't be trolley. Well, <clears throat> you, you know, if you don't look for it, you don't find it. So here's... Here's work out of the Cleveland Clinic, 688 patients, consecutive um, cabbage patients, um, and they monitored them for HLA antibodies, and they used the specific uh, radiologic definitions of trolley, and then went and cross-refed them with where the blood products had come from and could they identify antibodies and not. 2.4% overall incidence. So what do the blood bankers tell you? The blood bankers tell you the risk is rare. Rare is 1 in 20,000, according to NIH, um, <clears throat> NHLBI. They say the risk is 1 in 20,000, but here, out of heart surgery, it's 2.4%. Well, what's the truth? Probably somewhere in between. Um, but look at the mortality difference, 13% if you got trolley, zero if you don't. And <clears throat> incidence appears to be high, um, I think, in our patients because they're inflamed. To get trolley, it's a two-hit model. If you're healthy and you're having a, you know, a knee replaced or something, and you're otherwise not overall inflamed, your chance of trolley might be considerably less. The chance of trolley is the worst with FFP and platelets. It's actually worse with platelets than it is with FFP. It's less so with red blood cells. So that's why I rail against people in our operating rooms when they say, just give them some FFP. It, it, you know, it can't be as bad as all those red cells. Well, yes, it can. It carries all the trolley risks for us. And here's data out of the Mayo Clinic <clears throat> showing FFP, um, red cells FFP, and platelets in different, uh, different amounts of transfusion. And what you see is platelets are always the worst. So <clears throat> trolley, again, data out of the Mayo Clinic. 19,000 consecutive patients for two years coming to ICUs at the Mayo Clinic. All comers, all ICUs. So this is not just cardiac. This is everybody who goes through the ICUs at the Mayo Clinic. Their incidence of trolley at the Mayo Clinic was 1 in 73 patients who entered the ICU. That's a gray zone. That wasn't a definite trolley. But definite trolley was 1 in 200 patients. Wow. Isn't that a number that we should pay attention to? It's not the 1 in 4.5 million for uh, HIV and for hepatitis. 
But when we get informed consent from our, from our public, what do we tell them about? HIV and hepatitis. Here's a 1 in 200 chance that you're going to smoke a PVC tube for a few days and your mortality is 50%. Wow. And it's most common from FFP. So <clears throat> does trolley change by leuco reduction? Actually, it appears not to be. And in platelets, when we give platelets, they, from the blood bank, platelets have something called CD40L. That's a, that's a, a protein released, an inflammatory protein that comes off of their cell membranes. And that turns on cytokines, <clears throat> and it turns on a lot of things that cause vasodilatation. And all the other things that you and I would like to not be dealing with in the operating rooms when these guys are trying to come off bypass and we're, we're really struggling to make sure the heart works fine. Well, lo and behold, those patients who have high levels of CD40L, in other words, platelet transfusions, have a real high risk of trolley. So it all fits together that we ought to watch what we're doing. So FFP, what's in FFP? What's in a unit of FFP? Well, it's just plasma. It's the exact plasma that, that you know, you and I had, except it's missing some of the labile. It's, it's got partially reduced factor eight and factor five. Um, and, the, and, the, oops, and the FDA has said these are the indications. Well, in there is a big catch-all, surgical bleeding and hemostasis. And anybody can say, we've got surgical bleeding and we need hemostasis, so just give them FFP. Okay, so how much are you gonna give them? Here's the problem, to get the, to do the arithmetic enhancement of the basic proteins, you need a lot of FFP. And the more FFP you give, the more you're hemodiluting your red cells, and the more you're hemodiluting your platelets. So to get an effect, you need 10 to 15 milliliters per kilogram, and so that's about 1,000 cc's. The two units of FFP is peeing in the ocean. You might as well go out there and just take a whiz. It does nothing to improving coagulation. Nobody's ever proved it does. And nobody's ever proved it does anything in heart surgery to improve coagulation. Why does it work? Because time was gonna work anyways. And by the time you ordered the FFP, it came down, somebody gave it. Now things were homeostatically getting better. So culturally, everybody's patting themselves on the back that, oh yeah, we gave a couple units. The maximum effect of FFP is an INR of 1.8. You can't improve on that. So if you're trying to reverse Coumadin and you have an INR of 1.8 to 2, you can't do better than that. And I've seen people in our operating rooms with somebody saying, oh, he's got an INR of 1.5. I'm going to give him two units of FFP because I want his INR down at 1. Okay, whiz bang, how are you going to do that? Because the, 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 <clears throat> the science is that you're going to make it worse rather than better. So we do a lot of mental masturbation about giving this stuff, and it doesn't do us any good. So FFP is ineffective in reversing warfarin therapy, and you have to give a lot of it. And I don't know about your patients, but mine have a tendency to be hypo or hypervolemic. And for me to start throwing in this and hemodiluting their red cells, I'm chasing my tail around like crazy. FFP is ineffective in liver failure. Wow. Where would I expect it to be the most effective? In liver failure. Well, that's probably the problem is that people who've done this stuff don't give enough. And by doing so, you, you push the patients into heart failure, you push them into causing other secondary problems. And what about pediatric surgery? Well, let's prime the pump because we know we're going to have a crystalloid prime and, you know, the protein values are going to go down. <clears throat> let's give them FFP. Mayo Clinic studied it, albumin versus this, no difference in outcome. Um, and you can say that FFP was totally ineffective in doing that. Yet it persists that lots of people think they need to give FFP. I've tried to go at my last institution, and I'm about to push the rock uphill again, is to get FFP out of the cardiac operating room and just go to PCC. When we have a situation that looks like we've got a protein problem, let's go to PCC. So this is the four-factor level PCC, what's actually in it, 
and it's not just four factors, but it's a balanced solution. And there's procoagulants and there's anticoagulants. And I think the reason that patients bleed in our operating rooms is they've gotten out of balance. They've got the homeostasis out of balance. And so the beauty of this is that you can provide a balance back to them, um, cer certainly something better than we could have otherwise. STS says to reverse um, Coumadin, use PCCs. Don't use FFP, but yet it persists. How am I doing on time? I've got a few minutes left. Platelets, <clears throat> platelets are fully functional cells. When I was trained in medical school, they were thought to be just little discs that rolled around and, um, you know, and would, would plug the, the vessels. But these are really complex, highly reactive cells who can undergo um, very, various different levels of activation. And <clears throat> so, Unfortunately, when we put them in the blood bank, we do funky things to them, and certainly when we put them through cardiopulmonary bypass, they get very funky and they, they very often don't work well. And as I said, when we put them in the blood bank, 40 to 60 percent of them are senescent or dying or are apoptotic. So that bag of, that bag of platelets that you're, you're about to hang, 60 percent of them aren't going to work normally. Um, and a lot of them are bits and pieces of platelets that are extremely prothrombotic. There's a severe metabolic stress when they're stored, and it takes, <clears throat> it takes them a long time, if ever, that they can recover. Now, here's one of the things. Anybody ever had the flu? I've said this many times from lecterns all around the, around the world. Yeah, we've all had the flu. Really sucks when you have the flu. You feel like crap when you have the flu. Well, your IL-6, IL-8, TNF-alpha are about 35 times normal. In a bag of platelets, your IL-6, IL-8, TNF-alpha are 1,000 times normal. Well, let's give that to see if the patients do better. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? <clears throat> so if you go to the medical literature in leukemia, and, and if you go to the pediatric literature um, in necrotizing enterocolitis, those patients who get more platelets die sooner, die quicker, um, have, have much worse outcomes. So transfusion of platelet, platelets and peds, I said, necro, worsening, worsening bowel necrosis. And it fits that what you're giving is a very prothrombotic milieu into an already inflamed um, disease process. Now, anybody remember Dennis Mangano? Oh, yeah, I remember Dennis Mangano. He and I used to square off on debates all the time. So Dennis, in his first paper on aspirin, found that those patients who got, who got platelets did far worse. He didn't spend much time on that. He focused on a protonin. But, <clears throat> but it was in his paper. And this is one of my papers which um, showed that those patients who get platelet transfusions have seven times the stroke rate and mortality rate than those who don't. So why would we do this just willy-nilly based on, oh, I think they might need some? But there are other people who have different opinions. Um, Karkuti, who's in Toronto, has looked at their database out of the University of Toronto and has shown that he can't, he can't separate platelet transfusions from red cell transfusions for worseness of outcome. Um, and Colleen Cook <clears throat> um, has done the same from Cleveland Clinic, and she can't separate the difference, but she does note that vasoplegia is far worse if you give platelets. Well, remember what I said about CD42L, that you create all these vasodilating compounds secondary to it, and now, at least in my operating room, we have a lot of problem with vasoplegia. We don't really know how to control it, what to do with it, but I can tell you the one thing I'd rather not do is give them a bunch of platelets on top of it. So in my opinion, based upon the literature, I think platelets are bad, and we shouldn't give them we've got a demonstrated platelet defect that we know that what we're treating. Now here's one of the little known facts about PTs and PTTs, uh, particularly PTs. I, again, have seen people give plasma because the PT is elevated. The PT is always elevated after heart surgery. 85% of the time, the prothrombin time, is at 1.8 to 2, and if you start giving FFP on that, 
you're not basing it upon science, you're basing it upon an artifact that's come out of, a, of the binding of the heparin and protamine complex to the activator in the PT itself. So there's no reason to follow that. Um, so <clears throat> PCC and fibrinogen concentrate are coming soon to a pharmacy near you. Hopefully your hospital has PCC. Um, the U.S. Fi human fibrinogen concentrate is available. It's FDA approved, but hospital pharmacies are fighting against it because it costs more. It's just like, you know, the earlier discussion this morning about, you know, what does a centripetal pump cost? Well, you have to take a larger, longer view of uh, these kinds of things. Cryoprecipitate, here's what's in cryoprecipitate. We're not going to go into it in a big, big way. But <clears throat> fibrinogen concentrate does make a difference, and the Europeans are going to it um, nearly 100%. Um, we have done a lot of work in Virginia where we've embraced blood management, and we've actually found that by embracing blood management, we've reduced the utilization of blood products, and we saved over, over two years, we saved $49 million to the state of Virginia. They like me so much there that they kicked me down to Florida, so now, <clears throat> I, so now I live in Florida. Maybe we can save some money in Florida. So in conclusion, point of care can be highly accurate. Um, it can be 97% accurate for patients who are bleeding after heart surgery before we bring them back. Any or all testing is better than nothing. The best thing you can do is work as a team. Get together and make a difference and get away from this kind of behavior. There's an animal model for the behavior we have in coagulopathy treatment, and there's a human behavior model, and this is, the, this is how most thinking is done with heart surgery for coagulation. It's seat of the pants, it's <clears throat> let's do the same thing we've done for years and years and years because it's so difficult to actually communicate as human beings. Why can't we do that? Why can't we get into a room and somebody say, let's do something rational? So thanks very much for your, your attention. Sorry for the screw up on the computer. But, um,